Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I want to recognize the team at AFPI for putting this on. I chose to be here for a reason, for delivering the speech that we're about to today. I think this will be quite possibly the most consequential speech about exactly how we will get this job done of shutting down the administrative state. But the reason I wanted to do it and wanted to recognize many of the people in the audience today is that you have been at the bleeding edge of this fight. This is not an individual sport. This is a team sport. There will be no political messiah coming from the White House on high to save us. If we are going to be saved, it is going to be because we save ourselves. And I think that that is the mentality that I respect most about this institute. And Brooke, I'd like to recognize Brooke Rollins for her outstanding leadership. Let's give her a round of applause as well for leading this great institute. So thank you, Brooke. I appreciate that. I want to kick this off by actually a reflection on national unity. We are deeply divided as a country today. And I think the way that some in both political parties imagine we might get to national unity is through compromise. It would seem to be the obvious approach, actually, if you have people who are badly divided. Perhaps the way you get to uniting that country is through compromise. I actually reject that vision. I believe that the way we will unite this country is by being uncompromising about the principles that set the country into motion in the first place. I think we have to be honest with ourselves that America was not founded on moderate ideals. America was founded on radical ideals. That idea that you get to speak your mind, and you do, and you do, and you do too, as long as I get to in return. That is a wild idea for most of human history. It was done the other way. The idea that we're a nation not of men, but a nation of laws, founded on the rule of law. That we pursue excellence without apology. That you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. These are extreme ideals. And the way we will reunite this country is not by hiding from the radicalism of the American Revolution, but by embracing it. That is our true strength, our diversity and our differences. That's not our strength. Our strength is what unites us across that diversity. That's actually the subject of the speech today. One of those, perhaps the most foundational of those radical ideals. A radical dream that our founding fathers had 250 years ago. A radical dream that I have that many of us in this room share today as citizens in 2023. That the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. Not the managerial bureaucracy in three-letter government agencies, not elite leaders in the back of palace halls in old world England, not enlightened elites in the back of Black Rock's corner office in Park Avenue of Manhattan today, not monarchs sitting in three-letter government agency buildings here in Washington, D.C. That's what we're here to talk about. This is part of the project of reviving, but yes, also reuniting our country. And I will say at the outset, this is not a black idea or a white idea. This is not even a Republican idea or a Democratic idea. This is a fundamentally American vision that we fought a revolution to secure in 1776, that we the people create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. What's happened in the last century, and it did begin with Woodrow Wilson, the godfather of the modern administrative state, perpetuated by FDR, further exacerbated then by presidents and leaders of both political parties, is that we saw a gradual waterfall of political responsibility in this country, moving away from Congress and the Senate and the U.S. presidency towards three-letter government agencies that wield the most political power in the federal government despite having the least political accountability through unelected bureaucrats who have no backstop of actually being accountable to the public. I often think about the standard we should measure how well we're doing as a country is how Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, 
Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, John Adams, how would they feel if they were walking around Washington, D.C. today? And these are men, by the way, who deeply disagreed with a lot of, a lot of questions relating to the founding of our republic, but they agreed on one thing, that at the very least, the lawmakers and policymakers we elected should actually be the ones making public policy in this country. So against that backdrop, today I'm here to announce how we will revive the promise of that constitutional republic with three branches of government rather than four. That is the purpose of our meeting today. And we're going to get into a level of detail that is, to this point in the last half century, unprecedented, which I believe will spawn nothing short of not incremental reform, but a revolution, a revival of the ideals of the American Revolution in how we actually restore that constitutional republic. First, it will be a plan that reduces the size of the federal employee headcount by over 75% if I'm the next president by the end of my first term, 50% of which is implementable by the end of year one. Second, rescinding a majority, that is to say over 50% of federal regulations which fail the major questions doctrine at issue in West Virginia versus EPA, likely the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime decided last year. And third, the president's power to use executive authority to shut down redundant federal agencies and to reorganize the federal government accordingly. That's what we're gonna talk about today. This vision is not an original vision. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that. Good presidents, excellent presidents, from Reagan to Trump, have spoken to the same ideal. And I give credit to Donald Trump for taking more steps than have been taken in a generation in the direction with the Schedule F exceptions that they began late in the term, aided by many people in this room. That was a step forward. But in order to actually get this job done, we're gonna have to confront several myths that have been perpetuated in this town by advisors and members of the very bureaucracy we're looking to shut down that we're gonna have to confront and overcome to understand how the U.S. president can actually get this job done. We're gonna go through those today. It's our first time doing a speech like this with visuals, so you'll have to uh, be patient, see how this one goes. But I think it's important to understand the specifics. The first myth is that the president of the United States does not single-handedly have the ability to set what you would call the human resources policies, the hiring and firing policies in the federal government. That view is wrong. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that the U.S. president actually enjoys broad statutory authority to prescribe the rules of the civil service. If you want the citation, turns out the president, and I'm going to read from the U.S. Code, may prescribe such regulations for the admission of individuals into the civil service of the executive branch that will best promote the efficiency of that service. That's 5 U.S.C. 3301. Now, most federal employees work in what's called the competitive service. Well, it turns out the rules governing the competitive service for the U.S. president are even broader, pursuant to 5 U.S.C. 3302, that says the U.S. president has similar power to, I quote the law, prescribe rules governing the competitive service, which includes most federal bureaucrats. What does that mean? It's like the equivalent of working at a company. The HR department does not actually determine the rules without reporting into the CEO. It works the same way for the U.S. federal government as well. Well, that leads to a second myth that's perpetuated itself in this discussion of how we take on the administrative state. So, so far we've established that the U.S. president has, pursuant to 5 U.S.C. 3302, sole authority to set the regulations, the rules, governing the Office of Personnel Management, governing the, pers com the competitive service. Well, the myth number two that's been taken for granted in our national history is that the President of the United States is limited in his ability to fire those employees, pursuant to a part of the U.S. Code known as 5 U.S.C. 3513A, which creates so-called for-cause limitations. 
who would say that the U.S. president cannot fire a bureaucrat unless it is what you call for cause, breaking the law, doing something egregious. That's been the status quo in Washington, D.C. Turns out that is actually a myth. It turns out large-scale reductions in force are not covered by the statute. They're covered by a different statute, 5 U.S.C. 3502, that says that reductions in force are subject only to 60-day notice requirements and further what you call order of retention rules, the order in which you fire those employees. Think about it, the logic makes sense. If there's an individual federal employee who may disagree with the next U.S. president, who may have different views than I do on abortion or on gun control but works in the EPA, these rules are designed to protect those employees from individual politicized retribution. Like it or not, that is what the civil service rules say. But they do not apply to reductions in force, large-scale mass layoffs. And large-scale mass layoffs are absolutely what we will bring to the D.C. bureaucracy, both because it is necessary and it is sanctioned by the law of the United States of America. Now, I believe in getting into detail. This is an occasion to dive deeper into that detail. Under the current rules, the rules governing how those employees are fired in large mass scale layoffs are governed by the Office of Personnel Management and the OPM rules. The current OPM rules give that responsibility to agency heads. That is a fact. Well, I think that raises the importance of making sure the next U.S. president appoints agency heads in those roles who are prepared. I think it should be a litmus test for anybody who serves in a cabinet level position, a litmus test that that agency head is prepared to carry out mass layoff, large reductions in force as laid out in the statute. However, if such agency head is even as unprepared to act after on the job, recall the first point that I mentioned. The U.S. president has sole authority to set the rules governing the Office of Personnel Management, which does absolutely give the duly elected president of the United States the power to single-handedly execute those large-scale layoffs and mass reductions in force. This completely subverts the traditional wisdom fed to U.S. presidents from Reagan to Trump over the last 40 years, but will be a necessary toolkit that says that the CEO, the leader of the executive branch, does indeed have the authority to decide who is and is not hired in the executive branch. And I'll tell you this, speaking as a CEO, if somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. It means you work for them because you're responsible for what they do without any authority to actually change it. But the beauty of this is that our law tracks this directly if we're willing to actually read the law in totality. So now, because this is important, we're going to get a lot of pushback to this speech, I have no doubt about it. I want to go to actually a common misconception that comes up for how this... The next myth is that if you're carrying out these mass layoffs, you still have to do it within the structure of the existing agencies as they continue to exist. That's actually false. The myth is that the U.S. president does not have power to unilaterally reorganize or shut down federal agencies. Well, it turns out, the truth of the matter is, the key provisions of the 1977 Reorganization Act are actually still in effect. I'm going to read to you from the 1977 Act, 5 U.S.C. 901, active law today. And who ever thought it's worth paying attention to the words of the law itself? The president shall. There are statutes that say the president may. This isn't one of them. The president shall, from time to time, examine the organization of all agencies and determine what changes in such organization are necessary to carry out any policy set forth in this statute. 
What are the policies set forth in that statute? I've picked two examples for our purposes today. Number one, to reduce expenditures and promote economy to the fullest extent consistent with the efficient operation of government. Number two, to reduce the number of agencies by consolidating those having similar functions under a single head and to abolish, that's not my word, that is a word in the statute, to abolish such agencies or functions thereof as may not be necessary for the efficient conduct of the government. This is not a suggestion to the U.S. President from Congress. This is a mandate to the U.S. President from Congress to exercise the authority to reorganize and shut down statutes, words, abolish such agencies if it promotes the economy or in the alternative, if it eliminates redundant federal agencies. This completely debunks the traditional mythology that actually the way the U.S. President actually has to act is by going to Congress. Now, part of the reason why, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here, is after I remove that second truth, what you're gonna see is a myth that says there's a Supreme Court case called INS versus Chada that actually in 1984 dealt with a correction to the 1977 Act. And this is arcane stuff, but this is actually important to get to the bottom of what's going on. What Congress said in 1977 is there could be a single house veto of a presidential reorganization path. What the Supreme Court held to be unconstitutional in that case was actually the single house veto. So they said, no, 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 you can't do it with a single house veto. It has to go through both chambers of Congress. That's what INS versus Chada said, but it's been misinterpreted and fed incorrectly to people who have occupied the position that I'm running to occupy to say that that stops the US president from acting unilaterally. The truth of the matter is the, those provisions that required the US president to seek congressional consent, those provisions had deadlines. But the unexpired provisions that are still good on the books are the ones that actually require, mandate the US president to examine the efficient functioning of government from time to time. So now we're gonna get into the specifics of how this actually works. Okay, what agencies are we actually going to shut down and how? I mean, the final real myth here that I think we gotta pay attention to is this idea that the administrative state, as we know it, is somehow an impartial scientific management project that is able to take on what we the people can't be trusted with. This is what's actually at stake here. It is a skepticism of we the people and our ability to settle our differences on questions from climate change to racial injustice. See, the old world view was that the people can't be trusted. The people can't be trusted to sort out how to address existential climate change. If we leave it to the people, our planet's gonna burn its way to pieces. We're gonna have systemically inequitable results amongst different races. This is what's baked in. It is that old world monster rearing its head again that is fundamentally skeptical of a self-governing people. But what we actually have in this country is a constitution that in Article 2 of the Constitution clearly states that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. And the person whom we elect to run that executive branch, the US president, must actually once again be the person who actually runs that executive branch of government. That is the final myth that once we debunk it, we have democratic accountability once again, rather than puppets sitting in the White House, as I worry we have today, uh, instruments of an administrative state. So the question is, how do we then, on the back of having debunked these myths, how do we actually proceed step by step to taking on and dismantling that administrative state? Well, it is the source of regulations, and we'll get to that in a second. 
But what about the regulations that are already on the books? This is where West Virginia versus EPA comes in. So this is likely the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime when it comes to the ability to restore our constitutional republic. What the Supreme Court held here is that there are certain major policy questions. This is called the major questions doctrine that have to be decided by publicly elected representatives, those who serve in Congress and those who serve in the U.S. Senate. These questions cannot be delegated without express congressional authority to third-party administrative agencies. So here there was a clean power plan perpetuated by the Obama administration that came from the EPA that restricted what coal industry participants could and couldn't do. And the reason they found that violated the major questions doctrine, this is really important, is that that would on net result in about $2,000 of added expense per American family. And that was a sufficiently major impact on the economy that it violated the ability of the administrative state to actually do it. Well, that was an outstanding decision, well argued from the current court, which I give the prior Republican president, President Trump, immense credit for giving us a court that came to the right place on this question. But now we have to take that to the next level. If those regulations in the Clean Power Plan were unconstitutional, then that quite literally means that most federal regulations, I don't use that colloquially, I mean that literally, a majority, quite likely an overwhelming majority of current federal regulations are unconstitutional under current law in the United States of America. And on day one, January 20th, 2025, it is the job and duty of the next president of the United States under West Virginia versus EPA to immediately rescind the effectiveness of a majority of those federal regulations. And I will give you a sense of how broadly that view actually spans from independent contractor regulations that Obama had, Trump rolled back, Biden brought back. We have gig economy workers numbering in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, over a million across the country covered by these regulations that were passed in violation of the major questions doctrine based on the West Virginia versus EPA standard. E-cigarette regulations from the FDA that are driving more of them into the black market like many regulations at the FDA, which do not match any statutory authority that Congress ever gave to the FDA, are unconstitutional under the major questions doctrine. Car modeling standards for large cars versus small cars, emissions standards, emissions reporting requirements by the SEC, heck, even accredited investor standards by the SEC saying who can and cannot invest in certain kinds of companies. All of these fail the major questions doctrine test based on the impact they have on a family. If $2,000 per family is itself unconstitutional in the scope of impact, literally an overwhelming majority of these federal regulations will on their way to being rescinded during the first days of an administration that actually understands what's going on when it comes to the unconstitutional administrative state. So that's the first element is undo the damage that's already been done by rescinding the federal regulations that are already on the books. But now let's come to actually how we not only rescind the regulations that Congress never authorized, how about actually rescinding the existence of bureaucratic agencies that Congress never authorized? And I'm going to start with an agency that to many people, surprise was not, despite getting appropriations yearly, was not actually authorized by Congress. Let's talk about the FBI. This is an agency. If I'm going to make a book recommendation, everybody, I like to write books, but I also like to read them from time to time. G-Man, such a great book. It's not, a, not some Republican guy. I think he's like a Yale historian. Came out in the last couple of years. Pulitzer Prize winner, laying out the history of J. Edgar Hoover's legacy in the FBI how this was an institution that was created to be corrupt from the beginning, the same one that used illegally collected tapes to threat threaten Martin Luther King Jr. into committing suicide, they tried to do, is now being used to target political opponents of a different persuasion. Where does the corruption come from? It comes from 
something you'd predict should exist for a bureaucracy that sits in between a DOJ, like the equivalent of local prosecutors at the local level, and say other police enforcement arms like the U.S. Marshals, which haven't been corrupted in the same way as the FBI. So this is what the situation looks like today. That's the status quo. And in more detailed plans, for ease here, we've used a short version. There'll be more detailed versions right now up on Vivek2024.com laying out even more detailed reorganization plans. This is deeply pragmatic. Take the 35,000 employees at the FBI. 20,000 of them are in non-essential functions, back office roles, many of whom report into, of all building names, I'm not making it up, the J. Edgar Hoover Building right here in Washington, D.C. They're going to go home when we shut it down and find honest work in the private sector. But 15,000 of those employees are going to be reorganized into the U.S. Marshals, into the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the U.S. Treasury, into other parts, the DEA that are taken on, the drug enforcement, the drug enforcement problems that we have in this country. Because part of the problem when you have a bureaucracy that runs this deep is that they find things to do that they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Post 9-11, what happened with the FBI is they took on counterterrorism from drug enforcement to child sex trafficking to financial crimes and white collar network enforcement. These are areas where people had no specialization in the first place and they're rotating so we're at once less effective in actually enforcing the laws on the books while also creating the formula for the corruption that we now suffer or today. Replace Christopher Ray with James Comey or James Comey 2.0 or recognize that it's actually the underlying machine that was the source of the corruption itself. And I believe the only correct answer to restore the integrity of our law enforcement apparatus will be to begin with shutting down an institution like the FBI itself. We'll move to the next institution. The U.S. Department of Education. This is an agency that spends approximately an $80 billion budget per year telling local schools that they can't get those federal funds unless they adopt toxic racial and gender ideologies while denying, and this part's less well known, denying federal funding. That's about 10 to 11% of a school's budget to schools across this country that dare to teach kids how to engage in hunting or teach them how to practice archery. Those have been the bases for denying funding to schools while telling other schools they can't get actual federal funding unless they adopt toxic, divisive racial and gender ideologies and racial quota systems in their hiring. This is an institution that has driven the epidemic of inflation in college tuition costs while subsidizing four-year college degrees, not doing basically a thing for people who want to pursue one-year vocational programs. The root cause, the original sin, was the fact that the federal government should have never been involved in local education in the first place. So remember one of the bases for the U.S. president to shut down an agency, promoting the economy and efficiency. Taking that $80 billion and giving it back to the people meets that statutory test. And that's why we won't just put a good person, and I respect Betsy DeVos, and I respect people who have served in that role. We won't just put a good person on top. We will actually get in there and shut it down while moving certain of the remaining functions like loan collections to the U.S. Department of Treasury, that limited sliver of workforce training to the Department of Labor where it belongs, that's how you actually drive change. And so I'm going to go quickly through a sample of the remaining agencies that we will shut down in the same way. Take the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the three-letter agency that has stood in the way of advancing nuclear energy in this country in the name of promoting safety. We have no Gen 4 reactors in the U.S., the only country in the world that does is China. We have very few Gen 3 reactors. We have Gen 1 and Gen 2 reactors, which are 60 plus years old, which are less safe, even compared to Gen 3 and Gen 4 reactors. In the name of an agency, before its existence, you could build a nuclear power plant in five years in the United States. Now the average time is 25 to 40 years. Even as in Japan, it's closer to five. In France, it's five to eight. Falls at the feet of what Brooke talked about at the very beginning that administrative state. This was never passed through Congress, these regulations. 
It's fundamentally the culture of an agency that believes that there shouldn't be another nuclear power plant in the United States. And that's why since its inception, there has not been a single nuclear power plant built in the United States of America. What we say is, you can't reform an agency with that Shut culture. Down. Move a small number of the remaining employees to the DOE and to other parts of the government where they can use that expertise to promote actual innovation in nuclear energy in the United States. And so we'll conclude with this one. There's actually more poster boards back here in time permitting. We'll get, this is just the beginning of the list of federal agencies that we will either shut down or downsize by 75% or more, but take the ATF. And here I want to recognize Matt Gates, who is actually, I'm seeing in the front row here, for proposing, as I, as I recall <laughs> from earlier this year, a piece of legislation that would have, it was a January of this year, defunded the ATF and caused it to abolish its existence, which is a perfectly fine way to go about doing it. The problem with Congress is you've got 500 plus people that have competing interests that aren't actually able to properly oversee an administrative state that reports into the duly, duly elected chief executive of the country. Which is why, as the next U.S. president, if I'm elected, will shut down the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. One of the agencies that has been most toxic in even its misappropriation of funds. This is one where, and I quote the actual, the, this, is, this is directly from within the agency and the Office of Personnel Management itself. This is an agency so corrupt that this is their words, not mine. The ATF's upper management has demonstrated, and I quote, total disregard for federal human capital management law, regulations, policies, and practices. An agency that is now with their bump stock regulations and otherwise so far reaching beyond its constitutional scope, that can't be reformed. The correct answer is we will once again get in there, and you're starting to see a pattern here, shut it down. That is how you revive the integrity of a constitutional republic. And if you want to look at actually tracing and possession, move that to the U.S. Marshals. You want to move that to the Secret Service, agencies that have not yet been corrupted. And so this begins to give you at least a preview of what the new administration, starting in January 2025, can actually begin to do. I'm running to lead that movement for our country, but it's not going to happen, as I said, as a one-man show. Every one of us, from Congress to the Senate to every citizen in this country, has to play a role in reviving our country. And I want to recognize people in this room who worked hard starting in 2020 on the Schedule F exceptions that I think are a key part, a key step in beginning to reclassify federal employees to open up the possibility of firing. But what I'm suggesting now is the next President of the United States now needs to go further in having a deep first personal conviction that these laws are unconstitutional, that the regulations passed pursuant or not pursuant to those laws are also unconstitutional, and have the spine to actually ensure that we have one executive branch in the United States of America. And I think that is the choice we face at this juncture. Do we want incremental reform? Or do we want revolution? I stand on the side of a revival of those 1776 ideals. A revival of that idea that yes, we the people create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. This is what unites us as Americans, and this is personal to me. I grew up into that generation where we were taught to celebrate our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways we're really the same as Americans bound by that common set of ideals. E pluribus unum means from many, one. That is the dream that won the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. 
That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over group identity and domestic monarchy, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus, not a three-letter government agency is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we together will revive to save this great nation. Thank you all for coming today. May God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our United States of America. Thank you.